In the early 1900s, many hoped to see a park developed in Duluth going north along the Lake Superior shore. Eventually, a few blocks of property was secured below London Road and became known as Lakeshore Park. The park was renamed Leif Erikson in the late 1920s. After the benefactor of Inger Park, Bert Inger and his business partner, purchased the replica Viking ship Leif Erikson and donated it to the city. That vessel had been sailed from Norway just months before, retracing the voyage of the original Vikings. And Anger and others thought the park on the shore would be the perfect display space. But you won't find the Leif Erikson ship in the park today, at least not at this writing. That boat has seen more rough times on land than it did at sea. After decades of decay, vandalism, relocation, controversy and refurbishment. It sits in storage, awaiting a planned exhibit case in the park that was named for it. Still, Leif Erikson Park has plenty to offer. Leif Erikson Park is actually one of our more popular event parks, especially before Bayfront was built. It was our biggest park, and a lot of our major uh, outdoor events occurred at at uh, Leif Erikson Park. And it's built perfectly, you know, the bowl area and then the stage area, so it, it really is a, a great location. The stone stage, bordered by two small castle towers, was built in 1927 with the lake as a backdrop. Concerts and performances were enhanced by the natural amphitheater at the base of the grassy hill. Just east of the stage, the Duluth Garden Flower Society and later the Lake Superior Rose Society helped install and maintain stunning gardens with thousands of rose plants and bushes and dozens more carefully quaffed plantings. But in the freeway construction and waterfront development of the 1980s, the rose garden had to go. When they built the freeway, it was temporarily like disassembled. I don't know how you do that. Um, with a, um, a garden, so to speak, but they managed somehow to disassemble it in a way um, and help it survive for the time period that it took to build the tunnels. And then they were able to reassemble it on top of the tunnels. So it was an amazing feat. And um, I remember hearing that it got written up in uh, different architectural or you know national magazines. Often credited for overseeing and advancing the waterfront redevelopment at that time, Duluth Mayor John Fido helped forward the garden redesign. He brought in the ornate gazebo used by thousands of people for pictures of all kinds, especially wedding photos. John gives, should have a lot of credit for this. Uh, he was inspired by some of the cities he would uh, uh, see traveling around the country in mayor's forums and stuff. He was a detailed person. During that time, the key element of the downtown waterfront, Duluth Lake Walk, would be extended through Leif Erikson Park to the site of what many say is the pinnacle of park beauty when the roses are in bloom. It is a very well-groomed park. It's a very popular park for locals as well as tourists. The only reason that the um, the Rose Garden looks the way it does is because we've had some extremely dedicated staff and a tremendous volunteer output to help with that. Um, we have lots of weddings in the Rose Garden. We have to book them two hour slots uh, every weekend all summer long. Um, but a lot of people just love to go there and sit on the benches and enjoy watching the lake. The Duluth Lake Walk is arguably the city's most beloved and well-used park space. But it grew up from controversy and a public groundswell. Many people remember the junkyards and the scrap, uh, I call them sins of the past, all through here. Back in the 1970s and early 80s, a walk along the lake 
took you through a time-worn industrial zone. Until the public was asked, what should be done? The Planning Commission actually sponsored a series of forums in 1983. Forums that talked about various things, land use and economics and how can we make the city better? What should be our emphasis? Concentrate on the waterfront, get people access to the waterfront. About that same time, there was near constant debate and disputes over construction of a freeway extension right through the heart of the city. The freeway was so controversial for 20, 25 years. It, it resulted in, in, a, in, a, in a project that was shaped to do, for Duluth and by Duluthians and create a lot of open spaces and parks. And uh, these big boulders, of course, come from the freeway, freeway tunnels. And uh, the uh, highway department and the federal government saved a lot of money using uh, the short distance to haul the rock away from the tunnels. These big boulders provide a lot of protection for Lake Walk. We like to talk about the downtown waterfront. It includes not just Lake Walk, but it includes the whole Canal Park area, as well as the, what we now call Bayfront Park. With its iconic backdrop, Bayfront Park is touted by many a performer and concert goer as their favorite outdoor venue. Countless shows and festivals take place there. Since 2009, it has been the site of the Bentleyville Tour of Lights, one of the most popular and largest walk-through holiday displays in the nation. The newly enhanced waterfront officially opened in 1990 and tourism business soared. Yet this newspaper clipping from 1910 shows a familiar looking waterfront plan had been proposed some 80 years earlier. Regardless of when the upgrades happened, we know they never would have without the lure of the lake. I walk with a group of people in their 70s. All Each of us have been lucky to be able to do a lot of traveling around the country. And uh, none of us can, can, can come up with a walkway, walking experience that equals this. Just south of the canal and across the aerial lift bridge is a stretch of beach beyond compare. The naturally formed sandbar of Minnesota Point was an early draw for new Duluthians. We're really fortunate to have um, access to, you know, eight miles of, you know, sandy, nice beach shore and on a beautiful day or even a, on a cold day, it can be a beautiful place. That's what drew the first pioneers. They established what was called Oatka Beach on the bay side, where picnickers from Superior and nearby Minnesota neighborhoods traveled by boat or canoe to pass some pleasant time. But in the earliest days, before the aerial lift bridge, getting there was the challenge. Once the canal was dug in the early 1870s, what had come to be known as Park Point became an island. It wasn't until 1905 when the aerial transfer bridge provided direct access to the point. With a connection to the mainland, expansion of a boat club would follow, and an amusement park called White City, patterned after the famous Chicago Park, was put up as well. This was built and opened in uh, 1908 and was just in existence for a couple of years. The first person to ever do a documented loop-de-loop -loop on roller skates did it down at White City. Rollo boy! <laughs> the area lift bridge of today replaced the transfer bridge in 1930. And in the depression years of the 30s, a recreation site was built on the south side thanks largely to the Works Progress Administration jobs program. Though residential and business development now covers miles of the property, Park Point remains a treasured summer destination. The length of the sandbar's beach belongs to the public, and the southern tip, beyond Sky Harbor Airport, retains much of its natural state, with hiking trails that can take you back to where the city's first settlers found their respite. 
At the turn of the century, the acquisition and development of green space for public play continued all across the city, with some exceptions. West Duluth residents were left wanting for a spot to dip into the cool waters of the bay. There was Fairmont Park along the Kingsbury Creek. It was a lovely site for picnics, but the creek and its fast-moving waters across crevice rocky terrain would not suffice for swimming. So by the early 19-teens, land along the shore where Kingsbury Creek meets the St. Louis River was secured to become Duluth's first public beach. It opened July 4th of 1915, and by August of that year, it was one of the most popular spots in town. As many as 200 people a day came here to the Indian Point bathing beach each and every day. At Indian Point, they might spend a few hours, let pass a leisure summer day, or in the case of the more fortunate, relax for several days at camping sites that were set up overlooking the river. Today, Indian Point Campground welcomes modern day recreational vehicles. There is no longer a designated swimming beach, but there are docks for those who wish to dip a line. Further up the rippling Kingsbury Creek are even more opportunities for anglers. And where the creek makes its way into the upper reaches of Fairmont Park, you'll find both native and non-native animals at the Lake Superior Zoo. Established in 1923, the zoo has gone from a pen for pet deer to an exhibit of exotics including tigers, lions, and an elephant. An adjacent Kitty Land amusement park entertained generations of children. Once a full city entity and accredited keeper of creatures of all kinds, this zoo, like so many others, has struggled to stay relevant. The city still owns the property of the zoo, and in 2008, when we had our significant budget cuts with the city, they had to look at different ways to manage the zoo that were more cost-effective. So the challenges are, how do you maintain all of that? And of course, the, the floods in 2012 devastated the zoo, and they've really, really struggled with um, coming back from that. Those floods destroyed the adored polar bear exhibit, letting loose a bear and forcing its relocation to another zoo. It also caused the deaths of several barnyard animals. So the zoo has undergone quite a lot of changes over all those decades. Now, Fairmont Park and Kingsbury Creek are slated for upgrades in the multi-million dollar St. Louis River Corridor project designed in part to protect the area from future flooding. And another major redesign of the zoo has also been proposed. A push to attract winter visitors to Duluth steered the birth of the Spirit Mountain Ski Hill, which opened in 1974. Spirit Mountain sits within and adjacent to the Magny Snively Forest and Park, named for two former mayors who were champions of green space protection. A major recreation center for both downhill and cross-country skiing, the property is city-owned but not operated. Spirit Mountain is an authority, a state-designated authority and there are some interconnectedness with the city, but it is totally independent. They have their own system for hiring people and um, they manage you know, the entire location. The ski hill and park has added warm season activities like alpine rides and zip lines. And there's more to come. We're building 3.3 uh, kilometers of Nordic ski trail at the base of Spirit Mountain um, that'll be lit and have snowmaking um, so that there'll be consistency for those Nordic skiers um, that need to get out and get their fix. <laughs> the mountain's woodland was first set aside as park nearly a century ago. After the mature hardwood forest survived the great fires of 1918, 
city leaders, including Mayor Clarence Magney, recognized a need to preserve it. Views from on high at Barden's Peak overlook much of the developed and undeveloped acreage in that locale, where sweeping sights of the lake, bay, and river are enjoyed as well. Today, 1,800 acres of Magni Snively Forest, with its primal oak, sugar maple, and basswood trees, is permanently protected as a public wildlife habitat for some rare plant species and also the migratory birds and raptors that soar above and into the untamed land. Further east, the birds of prey are known to favor a Duluth Park built as the last leg of Skyline Parkway. It was Mayor Sam Snively, the developer of Seven Bridges Road, who envisioned the future observatory site. He wanted to bring the Hawk Ridge section from in back of the hillside to the front of the hillside to take advantage of Lake Superior views. So that was the very last road building project for Sam Snively and he was already 75 years old at that time. He'd be out there in the mornings, you know, chopping down trees and brush and uh, measuring and he widened the, the right of way anyways to make sure that development wouldn't uh, intersect with the, with the uh, parkway. But for my money, that's really one of the more beautiful views of Duluth is, is sitting up on Hawk Ridge and uh, just seeing that, uh, that panorama of, this, of, the, of the lake and the city. According to the Duluth Autobahn Society, prior to 1950, Hawk Ridge was used by gunners for target practice during the raptor migration. Once that practice was stopped, its popularity as an observation site soared. Hawk Ridge is now a 365-acre public nature reserve managed by the Hawk Ridge Bird Observatory. It draws bird watchers, researchers, and visitors from across the globe. Named for a prominent Duluth businessman, Hartley Park is one of the city's most unique green spaces. But not because of its ancient geographical wonders or preserved natural terrain. One of the ironies of Hartley, perhaps, is lots of places like Leicester were set aside prior to being developed, and Hartley was set aside after it was extensively developed. And so you have this old farmstead that's sort of rewilding over the last hundred years. Guilford Hartley made part of his fortune at a large agricultural facility called Woodlands Allendale Farm, which was famous for producing lettuce and celery in the early 1900s. We are at the root cellar, which is one of the few infrastructure pieces left over from the farm days. So uh, this is where they used to store the farm's crops. And there used to be a stone house here, and we're right off of Old Hartley Road, which is sort of the main thoroughfare that runs through the park. It was built originally to serve the farm, and now it's a trail that hikers, walkers, bikers, joggers use. Um, and people come up here and do a little exploration of the old farm sites. People used to call it Hartley Field, um, you know, 30 years ago, when you could more clearly tell that it was an old farm. When Guilford died in 1922, that was the, the sort of end of the active area of the farm. This area became a park in 1941. Hartley's 660 acres, so it really bumps up against multiple Duluth neighborhoods, you know, Hunter's Park, Woodland, Kenwood. Guilford Hartley uh, had an earthen dam put in, um, which created a much smaller pond than exists today. We do canoeing and we do stream and pond study. Uh, lots of families can be found out here. Fishing in the summer, it's probably a spot where lots of kids have caught their first fish off the dock. In the 80s, uh, it was actually further designated as a nature center. There's groomed ski trails, so there's the Duluth Cross Country Ski Club, there's mountain bike trails. All of them come together and help create management plans for the park. A lot of our lessons take place outside in the park, 
Um, but this is, uh, serves our school field trip program. So we see over 10,000 school kids from throughout the region who come here every year to tromp around Hartley and learn about animal tracks and traces and beavers and life in the pond. You know, I think our aim is really to help connect kids with nature. 